prior, um, there was an article in Legacy Magazine when uh, Marable first set up the research team for his book. In that article, Manny made the statement that he intended to rewrite the autobiography of Malcolm X. That sounds to me like there was already a conspiracy afoot to, to create another Malcolm that was more acceptable to the power structure. Do you have any comments on that? Well, let me, let me say this. Sometimes I'm in the minority on this. I'm a historian, so again, my first loyalty is to history, not to any subject, not to any, any uh, historian. What we're going to have to deal with is the fact that the autobiography is a piece of literature that had a propaganda purpose. The first idea, because remember, the autobiography comes out of the Playboy interview. Right? We owe Playboy magazine for the autobiography of Malcolm X, because Alex Haley interviewed Malcolm X for Playboy. Right. So coming out of the Playboy interview, Malcolm first thought that the idea behind the autobiography was to show the greatness of Elijah Muhammad. Now, Alex Haley, the liberal Republican freelance writer, hustler, all right, and I use that in a positive sense. I used to be a freelance writer, all right? They hustle, that's a hustle. Started making money. All right, trying to make money. Yeah. Haley had this view of Malcolm X that took out a lot of the political content and the content of religion, hence the missing chapters that my colleague is talking about. So. When a historian says, I'm going to rewrite the autobiography, I think, giving Manny Marable the benefit of the doubt, I think that what he means is that he's going to go and do a biography that's going to make the autobiography the work of literature that we know it is. People love the autobiography. They view it as a sacred text. I understand that. So do I. But as a historian, I have to ask about facts, and I have to ask about interpretation. And I think there's a need for biographies to uh, counter autobiographies. Because people who write autobiographies, they tend to shade the truth, they tend to shape it, they tend to lie. And keep in mind, using uh, current nonfiction literary standards, that is now encouraged. Everyone now makes up composite characters. Barack Obama made up composite characters in Dreams from My Father. Everyone does this now. Everyone shapes that uh, autobiographical experience into a narrative. So I don't view it as so much as a conspiracy as I view it as Manning Marable had a tremendous opportunity to build on the work of many people, and he really messed it up. Well, I would like to go a little bit past that, only to say that I... I that um, how did you just phrase it? You don't see it as did you say you don't see it as a conspiracy? Okay. Yeah, I, I see it as a conspiracy. <laughs> and you know, to, just to be fair, I believe all conspiracies. I'm, I'm prone to believe all of them. You know, and 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 as I heard from Ishmael Reed, if you want to call me a conspiracy theorist, you have to first acknowledge yourself as a coincidence theorist. <laughs> so, um, but again, but I but I can't prove it other than by what my colleague is saying by looking at the outcome. So it is important to note that that Marable uh, and Viking Press, and I want to keep saying it that way, that, that Viking Press and Marable, not, this is not just a Manning Marable book, and I think Wendy Wolf goes far beyond even what she would have intended uh, in admitting that. Um, but what they, what they set out to do was to, as they said, make this book, A Life of Reinvention, the definitive replacement of the autobiography. And as one of our contributors, Kamau Franklin, points out, I believe it's, it's Kamau points this out, that... that uh, when you finish reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, one of the problems that the established order of you know, power structure in this country has had and the world has had is that when many people read the autobiography, they became revolutionary, they became radical, they became angry and frustrated and willing to act on that anger. Uh, and though, though she and Manning Marable dismiss anger uh, as, as an immature emotion, I disagree. And as Malcolm said, you know, you, you know, um, people don't do anything until they're angry. You, you have to get angry. And how could you look at this world and not be angry? Uh, I think anger is an underappreciated emotion. We should be much more angry than we are. Um, and this is what the autobiography tapped into. Uh, when you read this book, the Marable book, what you get is, is again, if you, if you particularly by reading the epilogue where it's made very clear what is the political purpose of this book, you get a version, you start to realize what had been done the previous 600 pages, which is to turn Malcolm X into more of a Democratic Party liberal 
uh, as they say, race neutral in his pan-Africanism and anti-imperialism to the extent they even give him credit for being an anti-imperialist by the end. They dismiss Nkrumah and the anti-imperialist wing that was that was influencing Malcolm without without substance. They just passingly hit hit job on it. But the point is, is to create a book that, as they said. Um, uh, as I think uh, William Strickland, another one of our contributors, says that becomes a book that becomes sub, uh, submitted to the to the to the to the pressures of a of a market strategy or something to that effect. That if you want to have a, a Washington Post or New York Times bestseller about Malcolm X, you have to write about him in a way that makes him palatable, that makes him safe, that makes the Wendy Wolves not afraid. Um, so that they don't fear that they are contributing to a radicalization of a new generation. Uh, and this is what is done. So by replacing, and again, so by attacking the autobiography, which is what you would have to do if you need, to, if you intend to replace it as the definitive text, he does so throughout the book, but does so with without any substance. My comrade is right here. If you're going, you know, a, criti a critique of autobiography is important. But you have to do it with historical uh, on a historical basis, with evidence. And if you read Marable's book, you will be amazed at the amount of time he says maybe and probably and could have and might have and circumstantial evidence suggests and this and that. And then just leaves and, and then we'll conclude with wild speculation from everything from Malcolm's homosexuality to his infidelity with an 18 year old young woman. Uh, but simply by saying she could have showed up at his hotel room. Well, I mean, what is that? I mean, who knows who could be waiting for me when I get home tonight? But that's that's irrelevant. That's not that's not that's that's, so anyway. You but but so when you see what is done and with the 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 low level of citation and evidence and then the the, the horrifically low amount of interviews. I mean, for our master's theses and dissertations, we interviewed far more than 18 to 26 people or whatever the the, the final count was. Uh, but this is this is what I think had had to be done to, to replace the autobiography, which still radicalizes people to this day, with something that oh here read about Malcolm and then conclude that you can vote for Obama and that's the extent of your radical activity that's necessary. Right. You know, anyway. I, no, but I, I just had one more. If, if people don't mind. I don't see a line. I'm, you, I don't, I don't, yeah, you know. <laughs> no, I, didn't, I look behind me too. Um, uh, you mentioned Viking Press, mm -hmm. and uh, and I just want to get a clarification here. Originally, Columbia University provided the, the money for Marble to bring together the team and to do the research. Now, was the final product, the manuscript, was that the product, was it owned by Columbia and they sold it to Viking or Viking owned the property from the beginning? That, as far as I know, Viking would have owned the, 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 would have in a signed contract owned the final product long before it was completed. And Wendy Wolf wouldn't have worked so, so diligently with him had they not had proper proprietary ownership of the final product. So I've not seen anything that suggests that Columbia University had any uh, hold over what was to be this book. Um, they did provide him a house from which to do research. They provided him with research assistance. But I would encourage, you know, I have to be careful what I say about this publicly, but I would encourage people to the extent that they're interested and able to follow up with his claimed research team and ask what was their level of involvement. Because there are some contradictory messages that are coming out from we were his research team to we had nothing to do with the research to we're, we're still being asked to give paid speaking engagements on behalf of Marable. There's a lot of really contradictory things happening here. I will say this. I contacted Zahir Ali, as, as Todd said during our radio program, Zahir Ali is said to be his chief researcher. Right. I contacted Zahir Ali uh, shortly after the book was published and told him, I do a radio program, I have some issues with the book, but I want you and your entire research team to come on my show and I will provide you with every detailed question I intend to ask weeks in advance so that you all are prepared to answer my questions. Because much like Todd was saying, I was shocked by what I was reading. And I wanted some clarification. Uh, he refused to come on the program and has since even backed out of paid uh, events where he and I would have been situated against one another. Um, so we've not able to, been able to publicly get this clear. So I would just encourage people to, as they would like, to, to contact him and find out what was your relationship to this book? What is your research team's response to the now two collections of books that have come out criticizing this book? Uh, and, and see what he says. My question is, uh, I noticed in your intro that you said that there was no mention in the Manning book about COINTELPRO. And uh, that being the case, my question is, uh, I assume that there's very little mention of FBI or CIA involvement 
as well in uh, surveillance of, of Malcolm and uh, conspiracy in his death. Uh, who does Manning exactly blame or hold responsible for Malcolm's death? Well, let me just say very quickly that um, he does talk about the FBI. He does mention, uh, to a certain extent, the CIA, at least a little bit. And he does talk a little bit about Bossy, the, the New York Police Department Bureau of Special, uh, Special, Investiga Special, Special Services and Investigation, something to that effect. But, but when you read, again, with skill and nuance, I mean, Marable was, was quite a, a, you know, a competent writer. Um, but when you finish the book, what you read, what you conclude, or I would argue you conclude, and our, some of our contributors suggest the same thing. In fact, Mumia Abu-Jamal calls it tragic that COINTELPRO wasn't mentioned. Um, you not only lose the, the, the sort of political context in which Malcolm was operating and becoming a threat, but all, a threat to, but also uh, the FBI and these intelligence agencies read as sort of background um, you know, distant observers as, as opposed to, you know, intricately involved actors in developing what would become the assassination. Uh, so so uh, by, by leaving out the phrase COINTELPRO or counterintelligence program, it allows him to e more easily diminish the FBI's role in the assassination. And then he more or less follows what Zach Kondo says. Uh, in fact, Zach Kondo also contributes to our book says that, you know, I have many problems with what Marable did, except for when he talks about the assassination, because he basically just takes what I've said 20 years ago without giving me proper attribution. So saying that there was basically a co coming together of the FBI, the Nation of Islam, the New York City Police Department, um, and though, though he, Marable does not go as far as Kondo does into to bringing in what the state's benefit would have been. In fact, he says Farrakhan would have been the biggest beneficiary to the assassination. Um, which is absurd given what the United States government benefited and what international capitalism and imperialism benefited from in terms of the assassination. To say that Farrakhan benefited more than anybody denies, again, the state's involvement. It diminishes the state's involvement in a way that I think is dangerous and anti-historical given all the evidence that we now have. And uh, the other thing that uh, my colleague didn't mention was that Marable also uh, fingers a uh, resident of New Jersey by name uh, as being one of the assassins. And that uh, was some very tricky, you know, uh, uh, thing to do. But I mean, he was building that case on other scholarship. And again, uh, what Dr. Paul keeps talking about is that Marable claims on, what's the page, 400 something? 490 that, you know, most of the books written on, on Malcolm X in the 1990s were, I think the direct quote is, of shallow character, something, something in that effect. But this is the material that he keeps going back to to flesh out his narrative because he hasn't done his own research and interviews. But you only know that if you've read this other literature. And he's counting, I think they're counting on the fact that this may be many people's first foray into this work. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good Thank evening. you so much for this discussion. My question is, how did you determine the people that you would use for to collaborate with you on this book? Yeah, that that was a little tricky. Um, it was tricky in the sense that that that, uh, and I don't mean to disparage our, our, our um, sort of competitor critical book uh, from Third World Press, but uh, one of the things that we wanted to make sure of was that we were only dealing with Marable's book. We weren't trying to deal with people's full personal reflection on Malcolm X or you know anything. We wanted people who had actually read Marable's 600 plus page book and who were critical of it. So one of the criticisms we've gotten uh, from some friends in, in response to us using the Wendy Wolf piece is that they're saying, well, she just did what any publisher does. She just did what even Paul Coates did with us. Um, and I more or less agree, except that we are open about our political perspective and position in all of this, that we're saying this is we are not trying to be falsely objective. We are critical based on these criteria. Uh, and this is what we're saying, unlike trying to say we are writing the unquestioned, definitive, objective, whatever. Um, so we, we said we had to have you have to have read the book and you have to have a critical perspective on the book. And then you have to meet a certain deadline. So all of those things end up you know, encouraging some, weeding some out. Uh, but that's basically, we, we approached some, we put out somewhat of a public call in another sense, and then just invited people to meet some of these deadlines that, that we were very friendly with. 
And this is who we ended up with. Uh, and at the end, I think, though, uh, uh, again, obviously bias uh, aside, uh, you know, to the extent that that's possible, I think we've done a great job. The, the contributors that we have, again, are a nice wide array, both in terms of generation uh, um, and even within certain political perspectives from the left. I mean, there's not like this full unified monolithic uh, viewpoint here. And I think that we've got a very solid book in terms of what we've done, like the, the very specific in our criticism, well researched very well edited. We took our time with this thing. We, we gave it the, the respect that Malcolm and these ideas deserve. And I'm, I'm very proud of, of what we've done here and I'm willing to stand against anybody on this. You know, and that's why I keep saying we challenge whoever. And I've challenged personally, maybe, maybe even inappropriately, uh, some of the people who defend Marable's book to speak to us publicly and invite us to their events publicly. And, and as yet, as far, as far as I know, none, none has come. I discovered Manning Marable first not as a scholar, but as a student of journalism, reading the Afro, because he had this column called Along the Color Line, and I forgot the other title of the column. He had two different titles. So the very last thing I ever wanted to do was attack Manning Marable. It was the last thing I wanted to do. But the biography he wrote was a travesty. It was a tragedy. And I'm here to explain to the degree I can what happened. Uh, and Dr. Ball will, will go into this uh, somewhat as well. But see, because I was inspired by writers, great writers, historians and journalists like Lerone Bennett Jr., Jr. of Ebony Magazine and my friend Herb Boyd, who I just found out today officially uh, is getting a NABJ Hall of Fame award. So I'm very much in this journalist, activist, historian tradition, although I don't call myself an activist, I hang with activists and I kind of associate with activists. But I'm definitely out of this journalist, historian tradition. So Manning Marable comes from my tradition. And when I ran basically to politics and prose, like, at 9 o'clock on a Monday night or Wednesday night or whatever it was, a half hour before it closed to get the last book that they were holding on about this Malcolm X book. I mean, I just couldn't you know, believe it because I knew that Manning Marable was going to come correct because Manning Marable was this major scholar. His political biography of W. Du Bois was given praise by none other than David Levering Lewis, who has written the definitive two-volume biography of Du Bois. So I knew that Manning Marable had the goods. He had been on Democracy Now! Uh, two or three times around the anniversary of Malcolm's assassination. And so, you know, when I, when I got the book, I just couldn't wait to devour it. But I'm a historian. And there is a man who probably knows more about Malcolm X than anyone alive. He, he's from Detroit, and his name is Paul Lee. He is an uncredentialed historian, but he knows you can show him a picture of Malcolm X who will tell you what day it is, what time it is, okay? I mean, what Malcolm had for breakfast that morning. And one of the things that Paul Lee taught me was that you, when you got a history book, when you, when you receive the history book, the first thing you do is you go into the notes and you go into the index. You go into the footnotes because you want to see what sources the author is pulling from. And so when I got the book, I immediately started to jump into the notes. I wanted to see how thorough Manning Marable had gone because, you know, being in grad school at the University of Maryland at a so-called uh, public ivy, you know, Maryland likes to now, I don't know if you know this, but Maryland has now rebranded itself as a public ivy. Okay, they're at the bottom of the list, but they, they branded themselves as, you know, they're, they're trying to get there, okay? They're trying to get there. Huh? So... Because our J school, by the way, they, they claim they're the top third in the country, more like the sixth. But anyway, moving on. They did teach me that, you know, research was, was paramount. So if you do a major biography of a world figure, you have to have read everything possible. In fact, there, there are kind of rules that I figured out while in grad school that I, that I want to share of biography. Four of them, very simple ones. You over-research, that's number one. So you've read every book on the subject, 
You've read every major article on the subject. You now know more about the subject than anybody on the planet. That's before you write a work. You over-research. Two, you go where the subject went. If you're a biographer, you have to trace, literally, that person's life. That means you have to go everywhere they went. You have to find the people that they met. You have to interview them. I mean, it's, it's a process. You've got to sit where they sat, stand where they stand, you know, stood. There, there are things that you have to do in order to kind of trace that person's development. And that's not only an intellectual or symbolic act. That's, that, in many cases, that's a literal act. Three, interview everyone. Now, let me give you an idea how deep this, this goes. There's a historian by the name of Robert Caro who has devoted literally 40 years of his life to Lyndon Baines Johnson. He works 12 hours a day, seven days a week, in an office where he has read everything about LBJ. He has interviewed over 5,000 people on LBJ. He knows about LBJ. And he literally has Lyndon Baines Johnson's life charted day by day. For the last 40 years, he has written about four, I think it's four, four 600 to 800 page books on Lyndon Baines Johnson. All right? Now, Taylor Branch, a historian that I'm not completely in love with because he was a journalist first and he never met a story he didn't like, never met an anecdote he didn't like. So uh, there are many anecdotes in his books about Martin Luther King that are just flat out not true. But putting that to the side, he interviewed about somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 people for that three-volume work he did on Martin Luther King, which he has now summarized into a fourth book. So you can get really deep with this interview piece, all right? Four, separate your views from the subject's views. You have biases, you have perspectives. Your subject has biases and perspectives. You're supposed to know where your perspective ends and his or hers begin. And if you feel your job is to critique them, you have to critique them in a way that is put in the context of the work. Just like, for instance, if you want to talk about someone's personal habits, their personal failures, right, uh, especially those sexual failures, that has to have an actual purpose to describe a part of the personality that you're writing about. So for instance, when Carol is asked, well, do you write about any affairs that Lyndon Baines Johnson has? He says, well, only if they're relevant to explaining a part of his character or personality. But if not, then no. And I think that's a, a good general rule for historians. Now, my disappointment with Manning Marable was extraordinary because I realized that Manning Marable had broken all four rules. He had broken all four rules. He had a research team of about 20 to 25 grad students. Now, the original idea that he got the grant from Columbia to do was a multimedia website on Malcolm X. And that's originally what these grad students were for. But he decided to write a biography. He first decided he was going to write a political biography. Now, for those of you who are not biography connoisseurs, there are different types of biographies. You can write a biography about somebody without doing the definitive piece about their entire life. You can write a theme biography. So one of the, the theme biographies that you could write is a political biography. You could also, if you're uh, dealing with a literary figure, you can write a literary biography. For instance, David Leemings has a very good biography of James Baldwin. It is a literary biography. So he took Baldwin's work and put that at the core of what it is he wanted to discuss through Baldwin's life. So Manning Marable originally was going to do a political biography of Malcolm X. But it seems that he got a very big check from a publisher and decided that he was going to do a full biography of Malcolm X. So we had these 25 researchers go and begin that research. Now, unfortunately, Manning Marable became stricken 
Uh, and he was so ill that I understand the last year of his life, he couldn't leave his bed, and he was attached to an iron lung. So there was some restrictions that happened as he was putting this book together. So do I believe this is the version he wanted to go out? No. Do I believe this is the version that had to go out? Yes. And again, Dr. Ball may get into some of that uh, material and what happened in terms of the process of putting this book together, which is also very interesting. But the over-research piece is not there. He didn't do what David Loving Lewis did with Du Bois. He didn't do what Robert Caro did with LBJ. He didn't do what um, Taylor Branch did with Martin Luther King. When I went through the notes, I saw four sources quoted again and again and again and again. And that's when I knew this work was in trouble. Two, go where the subject went. He didn't go. Did his grad students go? I don't know, but it doesn't look like they did. So no trip to the Middle East, no trip to Africa. Uh, there were some grad students there who understood Arabic, and I think they were translating some of the newspaper accounts. That's nice. Not the same thing. Rule number two, gone. Now, this particularly bothers me as a journalist, rule number three. I mentioned to you the thousands of people that people like Caro and Branch interviewed for their books. And by the way, I'm not saying anything that you can't read. Anything you want to know about a book, you just read the acknowledgments, right? Because the acknowledgments tell you who really helped them put the book together, right? And you read the notes. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not you know, we're not talking about a mystic thing here, all right? So when I go into the index and I read that Manning Marable had an oral history collection of people he was interviewing for the book, and then he did interviews, which I think were kind of for the website, because remember, this was originally a website project, and counting both of those together, Manning Marable interviewed 21 people for this book, this so-called definitive work on Malcolm X that won a Pulitzer Prize in history. Why? Because the Pulitzer Prizes are awarded by Columbia University, Manning Marable died the weekend before this book came out, and they clearly found a way to honor him by giving him the Pulitzer Prize in history. 21 people. Oh, oh, and by the way, none of those 21 people was Betty Shabazz. Betty Shabazz was not interviewed for this book. He lived in New York. Betty Shabazz lived in New York. Didn't happen. We have one of the people he did interview over lunch who criticizes every detail of that interview and the way it was put together in this book. In our book, we have a chapter by A. Peter Bailey, who was an aide to Malcolm X, who was the editor of Malcolm X's newsletter, and he criticizes uh, Manning Marable's uh, modus operandi and how he conducted the interview and then what he did. And Peter Bailey is no slouch himself. He's a veteran of Ebony and Jet magazine, and he did a definitive book on Malcolm X's family. So we're not talking about someone that is uh, not qualified to evaluate how a writer is doing interviews. But again, instead of 1,000 people, 21 people. The fourth rule, separate your views from the subjects. Now, Dr. Ball does a great analysis of the book's epilogue, which I'm going to leave to him. But let me just say this. There is a larger context in which this book has been written. It's been a larger context ever since, frankly, the election of Barack Obama. The election of Barack Obama is being used as a happy ending to every black nonfiction text that has come out since 2009. And I was warned about this from a major writer. I had a major writer who warned me, said, if you write a black nonfiction book, from now on, your last chapter must be the election of Barack Obama as president of the United States. And I started checking. Like, I started getting nonfiction books, right? I started getting history books. Isabel Wilkerson's book, I started getting all these books, and I, I went to the last chapter, and I was like, damn. 
because it was, it was even a radical book on the Black Panther Party that we recently got. Even there, they struggled with it at the end. Like, we don't want to say that we're, we don't want to end it that way, but you can, you know, last five pages, they talk about Barack Obama. So all the history of African Americans, all the slavery that we've now seen in 12 Years a Slave, right, a little taste of that, all of the history is led up to one election for one centrist president. This is the narrative of book publishing in New York. This is the narrative. So the larger context is that the Manning Marable biography comes in the context of giving black America a happy ending. You're happy, right? You're free, right? You're happy. Okay. No problems, right? Living in Columbia, no problems, right? Right? Everything's fine. We have parity in every aspect of American life, economic parity, political parity. We're fine, right? So, but, but this is the narrative. So you have historians like Manning Marable who have bought into this narrative, which is fascinating because I had to do a panel about his newspaper columns, and I started reading his newspaper columns literally from the beginning when he was a radical socialist attacking Jimmy Carter for his conservatism. So that evolution is a very interesting one, from black radical to public intellectual with a major book contract, allegedly six, seven figures, to write about Malcolm X, giving Malcolm X a happy ending. Saying he was really a progressive black activist and not a radical African internationalist. So, I was very disappointed. Now, luckily, because see, Jared's always doing something, and he's always dragging me into what, he, what he's doing, right? This is our path. Jared was asked by a man who's here tonight, Paul Coates. Paul, please stand up, please. Paul Coates, our publisher from Black Classic Press. Thank you. Former member of the Black Panther Party in Baltimore. Paul approached Jared and said, Jared, I need you to put together a book critiquing Manning Marable's Malcolm X because there are all these mistakes in it. There's all these ideological problems with it. And I need you to do it. And so, of course, Jared said yes. All right? And Jared went, dragged me into it. And so began our journey of putting together a collection of scholars and writers and activists who read the book and critiqued the book. I'm proud to say that the first person who said yes to us was Mumia Abu-Jamal. And he turned in his work first. And I'm very proud to say that. Um, so we have many people who discuss many aspects of this book. and. We don't view the book as kind of a jumping off point to talk about Malcolm X. There is a book that does that. There's a book done by my friend Herb Boyd and Ron Daniels and some others called By Any Means Necessary, which is also an answer book to the Manning Marable biography. But we decided to not have a larger discussion about Malcolm X. We decided to have a discussion about scholarship and biography and history and Africana studies and the purposes of all of that, and how we feel that this is an aspect of a larger problem of African Americans gaining technology and access and information and losing their memory. We are losing our memory. And all the technology that we have is not aiding us in losing our memory because the technology is pushing us ironically away from our memory, which allows writers to step in and recreate our memory and say, well, Malcolm X wasn't really a radical. He was really just a progressive. Kwame Ture, he wasn't really a radical. He was really just a progressive. You know, they weren't calling for a new social and political system and connections with the African world. They were struggling against American democracy. They wanted American democracy to work and they said a lot of rhetoric that nobody really, that they didn't really mean because what they were really trying to do was to make 
America live up to its creed. Now, if that sounds like Henry Louis Gates to you, it should, because he's the number one model with this. His show is on the night, right? Part three is on the night. Okay, glad you're here instead of watching that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So we had problems. And so we got with Paul, and Paul helped us through the process and was very patient with us. And we produced this book, and we thank Paul, and we thank Natalie Stokes, his assistant and successor at uh, uh, Black Classic Press. We thank them for this. And we really appreciate this opportunity to engage in dialogue with you about Malcolm X and history. I think that's it for me. Oh, I, I forgot this one piece of paper I do want to say very quickly. While doing research on reading these Manning Marable columns, I wanted to look and see just how many books Manning Marable produced in his career. Now, my list is 27 books. It's a lot of books. Now, he says he's been doing the, Manning, the Malcolm X biography since 1999, 2000. He was approached by one of the daughters to do this book. Now, from what I understand, if you're doing a major biography, you're not doing a lot of other writing because you're focused on this biography. I mean, these are at least the old rules if you're doing a full biography. What I learned, which was very interesting to me, is that between the time he agreed to do this book and the time he died in, what was it, 2010? Well, just as the book came out in 2011. So. Right, so April 2011. Manning Marable had written or edited or updated 12 books. You can't do 12 other books while you're doing a major biography. You just can't. I mean, it's, it's just, you can't. And so a lot of what happened in this process to me was made clear in this kind of public intellectual writing books for the sake of writing books and being on C-SPAN and establishing yourself. A lot of it seemed to be that because you would think that a scholar would try to end his career on the highest note possible, but maybe he didn't think his career was ending. Again, he got sick while putting together the Malcolm X book. So it's just kind of a warning signal to me that if you're going to write a biography, you have to write a biography. And after you write a biography, then you can go write other things. Uh, so again, there, there, there's a lot behind Manning Marable, and, and I know some of you have questions and answers uh, that you want to ask me. I'll try to answer them as best I can about Manning Marable and his career and how he's viewed by the academy so that we can get more of that uh, discussed. Because you do have to find out how a book is constructed if you're analyzing a book, and you do have to find out as much as you can about the author. I mean, those things are just mandatory things. We have yet to have a major, for instance, black biography of Martin Luther King. All the people who have done the major works on King, who've won the Pulitzer Prizes and all the other awards, are all white liberals. That's why we get very little, little of King's radicalism in the last three years of his life. We get very little of his anti-war, pro-socialist perspectives because white liberals have completely controlled the narrative of Martin Luther King. And if the books come out now, you know how the books went in, right? All right, all right, now, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, <laughs> thank you, baby girl. Dr. Paul's family's in the back there. His wife, uh, Yanni, and his two adorable little girls are right in the back there. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've never really done any speaking or any real political activist organizational work in Colombia, despite having grown up here. So it's, it's a little strange. Um, and I think I fully get that whole, that saying about how you can never really go home. Uh, it's very different coming back as this person versus the person that grew up here. Um, 
but anyway, it's, it's, it's also uh, uh, very exciting, very nice. Um, so as, as Dr. Burroughs was saying, there are a lot of problems with, with Marable's book and its construction, the substance of it, um, uh, the method behind its production, its construction is, is, is severely flawed. And um, uh, my approach to it was more ideological uh, um, in, in my concerns with the book. Uh, a lot of the struggles, so first of all, it was great that Mumia Abu-Jamal was the first to not only accept our invitation, but to respond. But he also helped set a tone in many ways, because one of the points that he raises is that, that uh, Marable's book is tragic, as he says, in its um, complete omission of the counterintelligence program. The FBI's program developed, obviously, in the mid to late 60s, specifically in this instance, to target black radical groups for their destruction. And I think also important to note in that is the fifth tenet of what they said when they were targeting black America, which was that they had specifically called for a, a, a dislocation of black youth from radical traditions in the black community. They specifically called out and said, we want to develop ways to make sure that if moderates and young black people want to be revolutionaries, that they'll be dead revolutionaries, to quote them directly. Or, and, and they said specifically also they wanted to develop methods to make sure that black, young, young black people did not grow up with any, kind of these, any of these radical ideas that were informing so many people. Um, so, so part of what I'm seeing here, or what I argued and many of our contributors argued in different ways, is that this is a broad-based ideological attack, not only on Malcolm X specifically, but, but about the idea, on the ideas that, that, uh, that uh, governed him uh, and that he helped uh, develop and pass on and transmit. And he was one of the brightest conduits uh, uh, and exemplars of these radical traditions um, that impacted not only people in his day, but obviously years since his assassination. I mean, my generation, um, uh, I mean, every one of us in my generation e equates Malcolm and radical hip hop with, with our uh, uh, political development. Um, and I think this is part of the process or part of the problem as seen by the state uh, and its various institutions. So our argument, broadly speaking, is that Marable's book represents an attempt to negate a number of radical traditions that have, have continued to and must still impact black America. Uh, in order to let stand a version of Malcolm X and these ideas that best suits the middle class, mostly white, post-racial, post-Obama sensibilities of its target audience. Uh, Marable upset, as Margot Arnold says in our, in our book, uh, our black radical collective consciousness. And I really like that phrase that, that, that she develops um, to talk about what is upset here. So beyond what a lot of the attention that the book got in terms of the salacious claims of Malcolm's uh, homosexuality or infidelity or Betty, Betty Shabazz's infidelity and so on, despite all of those wholly unfounded and unsupported salacious uh, 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 reports or stories uh, or histories as they're, as they're told in our book or in, rather in Marable's book, the issues for me were about the ideology of the book itself. Uh, so one of the things I always do with a book that long, first of all, did anybody in here read Marable's book in its entirety? Has anybody in here read it? Just, okay. Uh, in part, okay. So this is important in some ways. And to, to, you know, one of the things that I do when I get a book of that size is I always read the introduction and the, and the conclusion first. And I want to see how they're building their argument and then what their, their argument builds to. So what... Um, when we first saw Carl Evans' re re response, uh, which was the first critical response I saw to this book, and Carl Evans is the noted author of several books on Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam, uh, most notably The Judas Factor, uh, he, I mean, he, you know, annihilates Marable. I mean, he really went hard at Marable. Um, and when I read that, I was like, wow, man, you know, wow, I was, I was, I was shocked, you know, because as, as, as Dr. Burroughs was saying, you know, um, from, for many of us, we had been anticipating this book for years. We had been waiting for Marable for years, and we had read many of his other works, and were just sure that he was going to do a just job, that he had the access, he had the stature, he had the resources that so many of us don't have, and, and for, 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 certainly I was certainly naive before becoming a so-called academic, but I didn't realize to what extent those within academia have to struggle to get certain things done, um, and that there are certain level there are tiers within academia, as in all other uh, phases of, of of our lives that I didn't really realize. So, 
Uh, for those of us who you know are saddled with four classes a semester, no no assistance, you know, advising loads and all this other stuff, we look to people of that stature who have, you know, either an Ivy League placement as he did and high salaries, but resources and, and research assistance and time and and maybe one class a semester or something like that, to produce work that we can build from, that we can engage, that we can be excited by. So when this book came out and I read Carl Evans's response, I was like, wow, this is this is this is about to be a problem. Then when when we did a, I host a radio show on WPFW in Washington, D.C., and we started to, you know, had Todd come on, and we started, you know, chopping it up a little bit. He got the book before I did, and he started saying, you know, I'm a little concerned. As he, you know, he started working through the book. I'm a little concerned. <laughs> you know, my, these flags are going off about how this thing is put together. Um, when I finally got the book, and as I said, read the, 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 the introduction and the conclusion, I said, oh, I said, this is a major, major problem. Uh, and it was it was evident that not only methodologically, as Todd pointed out, were there many problems, but ideologically, it was it's it's severely flawed. It's it's it becomes an attack on Malcolm X. It becomes an attack on all these radical ideas that informed him, from Pan Africanism to nationalism to anti imperialism, socialism, uh, armed struggle. Uh, all of these things are are attacked in very nuanced and um, uh, careful ways. I mean, Marable was brilliant. Marable was a good writer. Marable, again, had a whole team to put this thing together. And ultimately, as I'll say a few words about in a moment, he had the, the support of one of the six largest publishing houses in the world, whose goal it was to produce the kind of national bestseller and award winner that, uh, um, uh, that the book became, which of necessity requires an attack on these politics. You can't have both. So, um, you know, I started to notice, as he's very clear in the epilogue, that he wants to situate Barack Obama as an extension of Malcolm X. Now, I don't want to go too much into this, at least not, not in this moment. We can certainly later, if, if people are interested. It's not really, for me at this point, uh, 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 most, interest, most interesting to worry about what does Barack Obama want to do politically, ideologically? What does Malcolm X want to do politically, ideologically? What, I, what is only important to me in this moment is to make clear that the two are diametrically opposed. That, that I don't care if you like Barack Obama, at least right now, and I don't, you know, or whether or not you like Malcolm X, I'm only interested in that we become very clear in recognizing that the two are diametrically opposed. They are not a continuum from one from, from, to the next. They are, um, uh, uh, Barack Obama is really the antithesis politically to what Malcolm X represented. Um, so whether or not, again, if you think Malcolm is wrong, fine. If you think Barack Obama is wrong, fine. You just can't put the two together. Uh, without making some serious uh, 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 leaps of logic and politics. So the book concludes by doing a number of different things. It situates, it attempts to situate Malcolm X in line with Barack Obama, Condoleezza Rice, Colin Powell, who were, who were targeted uh, uh, after 9-11 by al-Qaeda as sellouts. And if anybody remembers, al-Qaeda had put out a statement saying, you know, this black leadership that the United States has today are sellouts in comparison to the great Malcolm X. So, so Marable has to, of necessity, to do what Todd, I think, quite accurately laid out, he has to position Malcolm X as not in line with al-Qaeda, but in line with these so-called house Negroes as described by al-Qaeda. So then he has to do, a, again, a leap of logic and politics to, to sort of make the point that well, to make the point, or the claim rather, I think unsupported or un, un, completely un, unsupportable, that Malcolm X would have joined everybody in condemning Al Qaeda, sort of uncritically about what happened on 9/11. They would have, he would have just joined the cavalcade of, you know, these people are savages and terrorists, and um, and that he would have stood with Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell, so on and so on and so forth. Never mind the fact that I think it's important to note that none of these black leaders could exist without the fir first the erasure of Malcolm X physically and then politically uh, uh, in terms of memory and so on and so forth after all these years. The same thing with Dr. King. You can't have these people occupying the same space and be seen as legitimate. Um, uh, so that's just one point to make. But then the idea that Malcolm X would have joined them where he's still alive in sort of this uncritical kind of confusing, you know, well, now I'm going to be on the side of Colin Powell, you know, the, the, the warmonger and militarist, and I'm going to stand on the side of Condoleezza Rice, and, you know, and I'm going to stand with them against 
uh, Al Qaeda without sort of offering what I, you know, obviously I think we could have assumed, I think more accurately, that he would have been much more likely to say an updated version of his chickens coming home to roost comment uh, vis a vis the Kennedy assassination and so on and so forth. He would have had, I think, a much more uh, progressive critique rather than joining the side of these very conservative replacement so called black leaders. Um, throughout the book, uh, uh, well, well, let me just say with the conclusion very, very briefly, with the epilogue rather, he, he um, uh, goes so far as to say that Malcolm X's speeches about unifying the black vote to elect, well, this is what he does. He, he truncates a statement from Malcolm X. So the statement ends as Marable quotes him with Malcolm X making the claim that we want to go door to door to organize black voters to, to become a united voting bloc and to elect uh, officials. He truncates that earlier in the book so that in the conclusion he can say that Malcolm's radical use of the vote would have prefigured the rise of a Barack Obama, where, which would have been brought into successful uh, uh, fruition with the black vote, as if, as if the black community sort of had pre-organized itself and predetermined that, that we would and all vote for Barack Obama when, you know, very, very honestly, the opposite is true, that Barack Obama was selected by the elite conservative wing of the Democratic Party, vetted since the 90s, promoted, and then given to us, and then we responded only after Hillary lost in Iowa, by the way, right? If everybody remembers, everybody, black people were still on Hillary's side until Iowa. So, so very late did black America sort of unite around Barack Obama and the, the potential of him, of him winning an election. But the idea that Marable wants to promote, again, as Todd points out, is, is, is the necessity with books of this nature that you want to sell. Um, you have to, to, he makes the claim that, that Malcolm X would have, uh, uh, that he, his, his electoral arguments prefigured the rise of Barack Obama. When in fact, if you read the full quote that, um, that Marable truncates in the body of his book, Malcolm X was saying we need to organize the black community to vote only for black officials who would only do good work for the black community. This would be a unified voting bloc, not a sort of this sort of um, uh, 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 a massed collection only to support Democratic Party candidates unquestioning, without question. Uh, it was a very different point that, that Malcolm X was making about the vote. Throughout the book, again, um, Manning Marable says, again, very little about the counterintelligence program. So he leaves out the, the political context in which Malcolm X finds himself. And the FBI reads sort of as a background um, you know, sort of a, 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 a powerless surveyor of all that's happening, not an actor involved in, in fomenting dissent within the Nation of Islam or fomenting dissent within black radical groups or with, with that within radical groups, more broadly speaking. Uh, and by doing this, it allows for the, the, the central narrative to be Malcolm versus the Nation of Islam which again takes away the threat that Malcolm represented to the state. It takes away all the body of evidence that we have that the state itself wanted to get rid of Malcolm X, that the state itself wanted to not only rid itself of Malcolm X, but all the people who were promoting the ideas that Malcolm was grappling with. Uh, so by reducing the role of the state, you can promote this more comfortable narrative that will sell books, that this was really an internal black argument where the Nation of Islam versus Malcolm X, they killed one another, and you know, the FBI was just kind of hanging out. It's kind of watching. No mention of Hoover. There's no discussion of J. Edgar Hoover. There's no discussion of, of again, of, of um, the, the array of intelligence community uh, agencies that were involved in surve surveillance of Malcolm X and others like that, and for what purpose they would have been putting him under surveillance. This wasn't really discussed at all. Instead, we get all kinds of innuendo, and we get from, Mal from Manning Marable on page 490 a complete dismissal of all the books written on Malcolm X in the 1990s. He, he's, he just says they're all insufficient, and then he goes back and borrows heavily without attribution from their work as he builds the story of Malcolm, including uh, the story of the assassination. So we interviewed and included discussions and essays in our book from Zach Kondo, who has written the book Conspiracies, one of the, 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 the strongest uh, arguments in terms of, of, of uh, uh, the state's case for wanting to get rid of Malcolm X. Um, we have essays from uh, A. Peter Bailey. Uh, we have essays from Rosemary Mealy, who worked with Malcolm X in the Organization of Afro-American Unity, which is not really discussed properly in the context of Marable's book. 
so one other example I bring up from that just very quickly is that uh, Max Stanford, later Muhammad Ahmed, is, is interviewed by Marable, uh, but only to talk about what he thought Malcolm's psychological state was while they were working on developing the organization of Afro-American unity. Whereas we have to include an essay in our book from Bill Sales or an interview from, with Bill Sales, who in his book on the organization of Afro-American unity talked more in detail about the relationship that that organization was building with Max Stanford and Muhammad, Muhammad Ahmed uh, and the Revolutionary Action Movement and its, dis, and, and its original name being the Afro-American Freedom Fighters and it engaging itself in urban guerrilla warfare. All of this is omitted from Marable's book, because again, he would rather talk to Max Stanford about Malcolm X's, his summation of Malcolm X's psychological state at the time they were working together, not actually what they were trying to do. Uh, because again, this would be anathema uh, uh, to any book looking to, to become a bestseller. Um, one other example I just want to bring, well, two real very quickly. One is that, that there, there are drive-by sort of hits on Kwame Nkrumah. Um, dismissing him as a, as, a, as a tyrant and a dictator uh, without really going into any of the context or any of the ideas Nkrumah supported or any of the, again, the context of, of, of what it would the state's relationship to Nkrumah have been in its attempt to destabilize him and overthrow him. Uh, um, and what, and, and so, so the discussion of Malcolm X's affinity for what Kwame Nkrumah was talking about, radical pan-Africanism under scientific socialism, uh, is diminished as sort of a childish fantasy uh, that he would later mature out of, that he would grow out of uh, as he advanced towards sort of democratic liberalism. Um, uh, Marable accuses, and actually I would say it, isn't, I, that's not a Freudian slip, it's, it's correct to say, uh, he accuses Malcolm X of being, of engaging in a race-neutral pan-Africanism, which... Yeah, think about that for a minute. Yeah, you got... <laughs> A race-neutral pan-Africanism. Um, now, yeah, again, how... <laughs> I don't even know what to say about that. No, how you, how you, you construct this notion that, that pan-Africanism is race-neutral instead of a specifically uh, um, uh, race-biased preference for the organization around the world, the unified organization around the world of African-descended people, is, is something that requires... Uh, well, it requires, uh, uh, again, leaps of logic uh, and the hopes that a target audience that I'll get to here in a moment will not pick up on such a thing, that the, the target audience won't catch something like that or will not have the background there it would qualify them to catch uh, a, a slip of language such as that. Very lastly, I just want to say um, in terms of this comparison, I was looking recently after we had published our book at, at uh, D. Eugenio's book on, uh, called Assassinations. And this is, this is where I, I realized something that, that I could have even made clearer, uh, although I think our contributors take care of this for me. Um, in D. Eugenio's book, he talks about the assassinations of the Kennedys, of King, and of Malcolm X as a part of a continuum. He connects the dots between those assassinations and draws links between not only people involved or agencies involved, but the political, but, but the political uh, um, threat that these people represented in the various stages and spaces that they, the, that they occupied. Uh, and this is something that, again, Marable avoids so that he can carefully leave this as an internal black nationalist argument that um, uh, ended with Malcolm X's unfortunate death and it leaves the state off the hook. It leaves... Uh, 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 Western European imperialism off the hook, all the things that Malcolm and people like him were very clear that they were trying to, to eradicate. <clears throat> Lastly, let me just say a quick word about uh, the publisher. Um, one of the pieces that I, I uh, uh, used to show or was showing earlier in these presentations that I lost in one of these Apple updates, and I'll, I'm just unfortunate was an edited version of a speech that Wendy Wolf gave um, shortly after the book came out. And Wendy Wolf is the lead editor for Penguin Press, that, or, uh, or for, rather for Viking Press, uh, a subsidiary of Penguin Press, one of the six largest publishing houses in the world, uh, who worked with Marable on this book. And Wendy Wolf, uh, as a um, middle-aged white woman who, who proclaims herself as a liberal who proclaims herself as someone who was scared of Malcolm X, um, uh, 
got heavily involved, as she admits and acknowledges, in helping Marable complete this book. And this is where I think you start to see the influence of a major publisher. Um, and where you see maybe the influence of a major publisher and the unfortunate illness of Manning Marable sort of coalesce uh, in, in, into leaving us with this severely flawed and damaging product. Um, in, her, in this excerpt that I had clipped, she says a number of things. She refers to not only her fears of Malcolm X and, and uh, the, the middle class sensibilities that were offended by Malcolm X, but she also talks about, she refers to his quote unquote native intelligence that he wasn't sort of, you know, a man of letters, but he had a native intelligence. Well, you know, I mean, obviously that's colonial, direct colonial language, if I've ever heard it, um, saying, you know, he really wasn't a thinker. You know, it's the same thing that Bar uh, Amiri Baraka picks up on in the essay we've included in our book, that, that, that you know, uh, Marable dismisses uh, Malcolm X as not a historian. Malcolm X wasn't a historian, so, uh, but Marable is you know, the, the historian, which allows his version of Malcolm to become definitive as the book's goal was uh, um, to be. Uh, and then finally in this clip, at the end of her talk, there's a Q&A in this talk with Wendy Wolf, and you see an elderly black woman stand up and she says, I appreciate you for public, you know, publishing the book, I've read into a couple other things, but I have a few problems with the, some of the citations and the sourcing in your book. There's some issues here that I'm wondering if you could address. And then she sits down, and Wendy Wolf just simply says thank you and turns away, says not a word, doesn't even acknowledge. And I think in many ways that that's telling in terms of the book's place in this world and the response it's gotten um, um, and sort of the defense around criticism of, of Marable that has developed uh, that that says, look, we put out something that we want to stand as definitive. We're not interested in dialogue. We're not interested in debate. We're not interested in exchange. We're not interested in being critiqued. And we only are only interested in dismissing any criticism as not wanting to allow Malcolm X to be humanized. And that became sort of the code word in popular discussion of Marable's book. We wanted to humanize Malcolm X, and critics of our book don't want the real living, complicated, human being that Malcolm was, as if those of us who have studied Malcolm, or certainly those who worked and knew Malcolm, worked with or knew Malcolm, couldn't understand him as a full human being. It could only understand him as sort of an idol. Which is why I do just want to conclude my, my portion here um, by reading just a, a, a short paragraph that summarizes the media response to Marable's book. And if anyone's familiar with, with Chomsky and Herman's propaganda model and about how media are produced by the estab establishment and defended by established media to set norms and definitions that represent the political will of the, the, uh, or the, the will of the political elite, this, I think, sums it up nicely. Uh, so consider, for example, not only the nomination of Marable's book as a National Book Club Award recipient, but the description of the book by so much of the established media world. Wendy Wolf, an editor for the, of the book for Viking Press, an expert in the business of psychological warfare, as I've at least called it, often euphemistically referred to as public relations, calls the book, quote, a comprehensive biography, and is somehow qualified, uh, she argues, apparently by association with the flawless Marable himself, to confidently assert that, quote, little serious popular work on Malcolm's life has been published in the years since the autobiography. So Wendy Wolf is saying nothing serious has been written about Malcolm since his autobiography. And this is actually one of the goals of Marable's book, to supplant the Alex Haley autobiography as the definitive text. And Wendy Wolf is going to be, she's qualified to tell us this, right? Of course, they don't explain how all of these works are flawed or insufficient. They just say it. Um, let's see. She, she dismisses the work uh, as mere idolatry. That is the, the autobiography and much of the work around Malcolm X that does exist. Again, not explaining herself. Uh, and she says that all this does, she said, th this just leads to the erecting of bar barriers to true understanding. Uh, the Washington Post calls Marable's book a work of art. The New York Times calls it prodigiously researched and claims that Marable artfully strips away the layers and layers of myth that have been lacquered onto its subject's life. First by Malcolm himself in the famous memoir, and later by both supporters and opponents after his assassination in 1965 at the age of 39. So here again, the Washington Post and the New York Times are going to tell us that Malcolm didn't know his own story or didn't tell his own story accurately. Marable will do that for you. Uh, we, we will do that for you. Uh, the Atlantic called it a comprehensive portrait. 
It was called a masterpiece in the San Francisco Chronicle, prodigious in the eyes of Newsday, and a definitive biography according to the National. So the very entities and the very representatives of the state that demonized Malcolm in his life, that demonized his politics in his life, that demonized the ideas that govern him since his death are now telling us that this book by Marable is the correct, definitive, proper uh, uh, version that we should all adhere to. And I'll just conclude by saying that I think that this, this is meant to, again, do what the counterintelligence program said it wanted to do 50 years ago to make sure that young people who might again become interested in Malcolm X as they're occupying Wall Street or questioning these ongoing, never-ending wars and drone strikes and NSA surveillance and all the, the inequality that is increasing, the, the, the devolution of the condition of black America and on and on, all as people start, might start saying, hey, something's going, what's going on? Man, Malcolm X has something to say about it. As, as they may revisit Malcolm X, this is the version of him that they would prefer, someone who was immature, who was confused, who hated women. You know, Marable says that too. He didn't like that he didn't trust women, that he had a problem trusting women. Um, never mind the work he was doing to promote women uh, uh, leadership within the OAAU. Never mind his relationship with, with, you know, uh, uh, with, with Ella Collins. I mean, never mind all of this. Um, uh, so so they were, they're meant to pick up a version of Malcolm X that would support the conclusion that Barack Obama is the proper extension of these politics, that all these other ideas from socialism to pan-Africanism, even to armed struggle, should just be omitted and erased from our history altogether. That's what we are, or at least what I'm arguing, and I think we've collectively argued, is being done with Marable's book. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I think it's important to add to Jared's presentation that the Wendy Wolf presentation that he refers to is on YouTube. Yes, yes, absolutely. So please go to YouTube and watch the Wendy Wolf. What is it, Wendy Williams? Wendy Wolf. <laughs> Not Wendy oh Williams. Gosh. Wendy Wolf. Wendy Wolf. <laughs> if Wendy oh Williams gosh. even said Malcolm X, I might pass. That's right. <laughs> <Please. laughs> but the, the Wendy Wolf, the Wendy Wolf presentation. You can watch this actual presentation and that exchange that he talks about uh, on YouTube. And by the way, she calls it our book, and right. she's doing a book signing. Right, right, right. right. I'm uh, yes. It no, don't she makes it clear that she yes. had a lot to do with the final yes. instruction of that book. Mm -hmm. She makes it very, very clear. Don't believe us. Watch YouTube. So, comments, questions, critiques, query? Yes, sir. I was just wondering. Uh, in your assessment, is it more a desertion of Marable's radical earlier views or a lapse in scholarship? Yes. Yes, right. Oh, oh. Yes. All yes. The above. Uh, Raymond Winbush in our book makes the argument that Marable is more of an opinion journalist who wrote nonfiction books. Speculative nonfiction in this case. Thank you, right. Speculative nonfiction in this case. And by the way, that's, that wasn't, I found out, an unusual view of Marable. When I read the New York Review of Books, review of uh, Malcolm X, a positive review, it did start with the idea that Manny Marable, who's known for writing books for the sake of writing books, and not a real scholar. I mean, the, the, the author literally put that in the first three or four paragraphs. So this was not a new criticism of Manny Marable. I, as someone who's looked at Manning Marable's journalism, I think he was a journalist who, well, to be critical, found a hustle. He found a way to get a PhD and get a job and write books and, and you know, many of these 34 books, about five of them are column collections, which I'm not against. I, I have a column collection in to a publisher. I'm not against these things, but his forte was writing political analysis. And again, his political bi biography, Du Bois, is highly praised by David Levin Lewis and others who, who know better. I think David Levin Lewis gets to be an authority on Du Bois since he spent 30, 20 years of his life researching and writing about Du Bois. I just think in this particular case, my, my speculation is that Manny Marable, who started the kind of black radical public intellectual when Michael Eric Dyson was in the welfare line at 19 years old, um, I think that he felt that a lot of that had passed him by. He hooked up Dyson, he hooked up Melissa Harris Perry at Columbia, gave him some prime positions, but he started the whole train. 
And I think this was an attempt to benefit and to get what I guess he felt was deserved public intellectual recognition through this autobiography. I mean, that, that's purely speculative on my part, but it, it gives you an idea of uh, how Manny Marable operated, because he always had a book in process. Um, I'm disturbed as a purist the way things are constantly being redefined. For instance, one of these 12 books I mentioned that he worked on while doing this autobiography, while doing this biography, is he did a quote unquote autobiography of Medgar Evers. Now I'm gonna tell you why I'm calling it a quote unquote autobiography. Because he got with Murley Evers. Murley Evers had some NAACP reports that Medgar had written in Mississippi. And they took those reports and that became the main body of an autobiography of Medgar Evers because as you know from marketing, if you call something an autobiography, you're gonna go and buy it because you're gonna think, well this is the person he wrote it himself. And, and, and if you just call it the papers of Medgar Evers, you might not get a major book contract, you might not get sales. So this is the kind, I mean I hate to be this critical, but I have to be honest with you about the kind of work Manning Marable was trying to cash in on as a result of being a pioneer of the hustling that Dyson and West and all of these people now do with abandon. So these were the kind of projects he was doing while working on this biography. And I'm just being honest. Well, I think it's important also to note, I mean, if you look at who supported and wrote blurbs for his book, I mean, these are the very people, Marable, Dyson, I mean, uh, Dyson, West, and Gates. Um, and Gates pioneered this as well in, in, you know, years ago, calling himself an intellectual entrepreneur, which I thought was the most clear and obvious admission that I'm here to get paid off of this stuff regardless of what I have to do to the history. Uh, and Gates' background as a, is a literary theorist. He is not a historian. He became a historian because of this intellectual oper uh, um, entrepreneurship opportunity. And by the way, we forgot to mention something very clear. One of the rules of biography, and the rule is so obvious I didn't even list it in the four, is that if you are doing a biography on a subject and there are experts in the, in the field, that you give it to experts in the field to read before it comes out. Not one scholar of Malcolm X read this book before it became published. If you don't get anything from what we're saying tonight, walk home with that. There was no Malcolm X scholar that vetted this. Book. Well, they couldn't because he dismisses all of them. There you go. Without yes. mentioning them on page 49, he just says all of them. But he keeps <laughs> quoting Peter Goldman, which right. means to me that there must be some validity to Peter Goldman's biography of Malcolm X, which was last updated in 1978. So it seems to be that the Goldman text for a biography this white liberal kind of melancholy uh, portrayal of Malcolm X may still be the standard biography. That at least starts off with a serious critique, a self-critique of the author. I mean, he's, you know, Goldman starts off the book by saying, look, there's some serious flaws with me being the one doing this. Uh, and he puts those on the table. He doesn't say, I am the unquestioned authority that cannot, you know, that, that is producing a definitive Text. Yeah, yeah um, I think what I got from this is the thrust of both of your presentations is the politics and ideology of biographies and autobiographies. And I think what reading um, biographies and autobiographies of civil rights leaders um, in the 60s, especially in the late 60s, early, uh, late 50s, early 60s, when most of the stuff was happening, not just in America, but globally, in the diaspora and black movement mm -hmm. from Africa all the way to the Caribbean mm -hmm. and Brazil and, and the like, is it seems to be a reinvention, okay, for better or for worse. But I, I, I agree with you. Um, in part, in the sense that if you look at Martin Luther King at the time he died, he was becoming more radical in many ways, okay? And Malcolm X, which is perhaps where I disagree with you, 
is that Malcolm X was um, rethinking this whole definition of blackness vis-a-vis -vis <coughs> whiteness because Malcolm X was defining blackness uh, by denigrating uh, or shouting down white people. I don't want to use the word denigrating, but saying cataloging all these things historically that white people had done against black people. And I think there was a turning point where, when he went to, to Hajj in Mecca and came back, when he realized, wait a minute, I, I really don't think I need to, uh, uh, again, in, it was only showing Kyle who said that um, by opposing Senghor with the whole notion of negritude, okay, um, that the tiger needs not to proclaim its tigritude, that if you're a tiger, you don't need to boast that you're a tiger. Being a tiger would demonstrate itself. And I think that metaphor I want to kind of translate or transfer onto Malcolm X at that critical juncture of his, of his transition, okay, of his own self-evolution and reflection, talk about not being a native intellectual, but being a developed grown intellectual, in the sense I realize, wait a minute, I really do not think, uh, I, I, I think there's a certain kind of blackness, okay, in all its shade, he starts seeing shades in the yeah, blackness. But, but expanding, but it, expand, go ahead, go If ahead, you may bear with me, mm -hmm. he starts seeing the shade of blackness and starts seeing in that complexity its strength. Right. And I think, uh, for me, if you look at the history and the evolution and so on and so forth, I've not read my, 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 my book. I'm not trying to endorse. I cannot, as a true, as as somebody who wants to be a true academic mm -hmm. and intellectual, speak to or for without having read it. Sure. But I think that um, clearly, what we see, um, and I do agree, there is there's a part that we cannot really understand Barack Obama, okay, where he is today, without seeing him for better or for worse as a continuum because he is a product of all the civil rights fights and movements. We I, I see him today right. not a, I, he's, not a I, 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 he's a response. I, right. I, I want Jared to, to deal in depth with what you said, but I want to focus on the autobiography and biography mm -hmm. part. All right. Yeah. This is where I get to be controversial. I always love this part. All right. Can you kind of summarize yeah, the comment question? Sure. He, he talked that. about the, the political nature of biography and that. He talked about the political nature of biography and autobiography first, which is what I'm going to address. Then he talked about how he disagreed with the idea that uh, Malcolm X um, was becoming more radical in a racial way. In other words, he said that Malcolm X was reevaluating race in the context of international radical politics, which I know Dr. Ball was well qualified to answer. That's why I want to focus on the autobiography biography part. So let me just briefly drop this little bomb, and then I'll let him go. Here's my bomb. It is time. It, it, it is time in the 21st century. No, I don't know. We haven't dropped bombs yet. It's time in the 21st century to have a sophisticated view of autobiography and biography. The autobiography of Malcolm X is also a commercial product, in which people had competing views of what they wanted that book to be. First, let's start with Malcolm X. Now, first of all, I know people in this audience know that we have to thank Playboy magazine for the autobiography of Malcolm X. I know we all know that. Malcolm X was interviewed by Alex Haley for Playboy magazine in a brand new feature, the Playboy interview. All right? Um, a book publisher at Valentine read that and said, this is a fantastic story. It needs to be a book. Malcolm X's original idea was to tell a Saul slash Paul story of conversion and the greatness of Elijah Muhammad. So when he and Haley start collaborating, they start collaborating with that idea. Now, Haley, uh, a Republican, but back then, you know, you were, Republicans were more liberal view, view than they are now, of course. He had a view of, well, Malcolm X needs to tell this story and we, we need to take out his critique of religion we need to take out the strongest things he says about white supremacy and Christianity, and we leave that out. That's why there are missing chapters to the autobiography that a lawyer in Detroit has been holding on to. Those are very critical views. Now, 
We only have Alex Haley's word that Malcolm X read the last version of the autobiography before it got published. And this crowd is old enough to know that Alex Haley is a storyteller. Remember he told that story of how he found his ancestor? That's not true. Remember that story he told? And it was a great story, right? We all cried watching James Earl Jones, right? And that last episode of Roots 2, right? Okay. So we know Alex Haley is a storyteller, so we know we can't trust him, okay? So we have a book that people want to view as holy writ, which it's not. The autobiography is not holy writ. The autobiography is a version of Malcolm X's story that has been endorsed by the family, by Alex Haley's estate, and by Grove Press, which was the place that finally published it. So we have to have a more sophisticated view of autobiography and biography and ask, what are the purposes of the authors behind autobiographies and biographies? So I just want to say that. Now, those, those scholars of Malcolm X, like Paul Lee, I'm just explaining the context of this. So now people like Paul Lee have to say, you know, scholars of Malcolm X, if you want to know about Malcolm X, go and listen to him speak. Go and read the transcripts of those speeches and other books. So we, we, have, we can't stop with the autobiography. I know that's what we want to do, but we can't stop with the autobiography. We start with the autobiography. And then we go to other works of Malcolm X where we see more of that political progression that I know Jerry wants to get to. I mean, all I would just say is that, I, I mean, this is often, I think, if I understood you correctly, this is often the point that, that I think is confused. This idea that Malcolm was rethinking and reconsidering is not necessarily a reinvention of his critique of, uh, of, of, of white people or European imperialism or Western right. Europe's right. position on the world. Right. It, was, it was to say, I am, re I am willing to consider the world as it confronts me, which is why he was also very clear uh, that vis-a-vis -vis white people in America, there had been no change. He, said, he still said, even after his trip to Mecca, that, that John Brown was the, the ideal and the, the, the standard by which he would judge white involvement in his work. He was still looking to develop guerrilla warfare groups. He was still urban guerrilla warfare groups. So you can't... So this idea that, that, that he was, as Marable and others tried to promote, that he was softening and liberalizing to the point where he would have been in line with, with this product. Uh, uh, That's not what I'm saying. Oh, then maybe I misunderstood. No, I, what I'm yeah, saying is... Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. But I just, just want to say, say very clearly yeah, that, that this is my point, though, that, 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 that again, you, it, it cannot, it, it must be clear. It, it, it cannot be substantiated that Barack Obama is anything but the negation of the movement or the trajectory or the tradition that Malcolm X was a representative of. He is not an extension of that movement. He is not an, a culmination of that movement. He is a state-sponsored product meant to speak against that movement, which is what he does in his books, which is what he does every time he gets in front of a microphone. Specifically, he's talking about black people. He is... He is this, he is, so, so that's what I'm trying to say, that, that this idea that, that, Mar I mean, that Malcolm X came back from Mecca and became a liberal Democrat now, is pure mythology. Now, we're going to move on, but I just want to drop another mini-bomb. Malcolm X understood public relations very well. He understood how to manipulate the media very well. When he talks about going to Mecca, that was not his first time going to Mecca. That's a, yeah. That was not his first time seeing white Muslims. And you know who talks about this? Peter Goldman does, where he says that Malcolm's response coming from Mecca, when he started sending those postcards to MS Handler, the New York Times, and all those folks, was public relations. Because he wanted to create a narrative that said, oh, now I know that white people can be Muslims. And that's why when he came back and said, if white people study Islam, people forget that part. They said whites could be brothers with us if they studied Islam. That's what he says coming back from the airport. You can watch it on YouTube. So Malcolm was playing a PR game, which he always did, by the way, and we can talk about that if you wish, but Malcolm was playing a PR game by creating that Mecca Brotherhood narrative so that he can go and, go and work in the radical elements of the civil rights movement and be accepted there. And that's, nothing that, that's something that's never discussed, unless you talk to real Malcolm X scholars. Okay, uh, any other questions? Hey, you mentioned a, a friend of mine I went to school with, Paul Lee, uh -huh. and you described him as definitive authority, yes. scholar. Yes. Yes. What, what, with, with all that he's accumulated and yes. all that he has, 
I mean, I know he's contributed to projects here and there, but what, you know, this this whole thing that we're discussing today is supposed to be some kind of definitive pro uh, a biography, yes. you know, and the, and the, we debating the, the yes. merits and legitimacy of that. Yes. What is he doing, and who's working with him to uh, to bring out something? You have to ask him. Uh, he's in Detroit. Did anybody not hear? I was asking about they, they mentioned a particular person in Detroit. I think he's right, Detroit. the Detroit area. Right. Uh, Paul Lee, who's uh, right. a human, done a lot of research on uh, right. Malcolm X. And, and he just wanted to know what Paul Lee had done. And, and I was about to say that you need to ask him. Uh, I'm just ask, are you aware yeah. of anything? I, Paul is always working on projects, uh, but Paul's official response is that I set up forums and I set up mechanisms for Malcolm to speak for himself. Mm -hmm. And so that's his official position on that. Now, if you want to know what's coming out new, in about three or four weeks, Herb Boyd and Oyasa Shabazz are putting out the diary of Malcolm X, the international diary. Malcolm kept the diary when he went around to Africa and to what he called the Muslim world, what we call the so-called Middle East. And this diary had never been transcribed or annotated, and now Herb Boyd and Oyasa Shabazz have transcribed and annotated this diary, and this diary is coming out uh, in Third World Press in about three or four weeks from now. So how much material is that? I mean, how it's a small diary that they've annotated and, and, and um, um, uh, added some material to. I mean, Malcolm X was quite busy, as you know, and so he just, on, one or two he, kept, he, kept, yeah, he kept notes, and so these notes are commented on. Um, but that's, that's all we can say in terms of Paul. Paul and was the last there. thing I want to ask you yeah. about sure. somebody else. The, um, the missing chapters from the autobiography that you said some some lawyer has purchased and is right. going on to. Is there anything going to be done or materialized with that? Jared, talk to him. I had a very long and I have to say confusing conversation with uh, uh, um, Gregory Reed mm -hmm. um, uh, about why what he wants to do with them and why haven't we seen them yet and when are they coming out. And uh, all I can say is I have no idea. Yeah. After that conversation, I, all I kept saying was, <laughs> I and my crew will work forever for free. Whatever you want, let us help put these out. And the response I got was, I, get, I can't even, I couldn't even explain it, but just confusing. I'm confused. So I have, I'm, I'm no more clear now after having spoken with him why we haven't seen them. Um, there was something about, an argument about, uh, uh, preserving them for our community, yeah. but I don't understand how, and I kept saying I don't understand how not publishing, how publishing them isn't preserving them. Like, I don't understand why we all not having copies is right. not preserving. I don't understand why you having them and only you seeing them is preserving them for all of us. I don't understand. And so, this, this was material that Alex Haley had in his Alex. estate and that, that was purchased by this right. That's right. Now, I will oh, say, death. right, that's correct. I will say that Marable's public account of why he could, what happened when he tried to see those chapters from, uh, is completely the opposite of Reed's account of what happened. Marable said he was, he tried and was said and was told he could only see a few of them for 15 minutes and that was it. Mm. Um, and Reed said, I chased Marable as I've chased other major black scholars to try to get them to work with me on this, and Marable only would give me 15 minutes of his time. So, so somebody is not telling the truth. Unfortunately, only one of them is living, and he doesn't want to say much publicly. So I don't know, what, I don't, I, honestly, it's, and, it's frustrating. And you can now, hear Marable's account on Democracy Now! If you now, don't watch one of those. I will say, things. and I agree with, that when I was a more active member of the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, there was some discussion in that organization of putting public pressure on Reed to give up those chapters. Mm -hmm. And I do think that that is something that, that people should consider because I don't, I don't think, uh, absent a better explanation, that, that we don't deserve to see. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes? I wanted to ask you, before we have to stop questions, what was, has been the response to your work? That's a good question. Uh, I think the biggest response has been no response. I think that those who have read our book, who have read Marable's book and other critiques of the book, recognize that what we've done is correct. I think I've, I've spoken to many who, whose opinion we changed completely. Um, but I think the biggest weapon they have is uh, a, a, the omission campaign. Um, so I even 
drafted and submitted an open letter to Cornell West and Tavis Smiley, who continually would interview Zahir Ali, who was the chief researcher of, of the, or promoted as the chief researcher of the Marable book. And I've said that, that who in all these discussions keep saying, Marable would have wanted debate, and Marable would have welcomed debate, and would have, but he won't grant us a debate. He won't, he has removed himself from paid panel visits when he's heard I would be there. And this has happened, I think, at least three times. Um, uh, and Smiley, we debated him on Al Jazeera, uh, only, uh, English, yeah. and it was only because the producer did not tell him we were there. <laughs> and it was the only, and it's the only time that any of these Marable folks have been directly challenged. Wow. And up until two months ago, when Al Jazeera America uh, premiered and shut down your access to Al Jazeera English, up until two months ago, you were able to see this on you YouTube. You still can. You still can. You still can. You still can. Great. But, but okay. Um, but anyway, but but so I, you know, I think that there's been, you know, Marable had, you know, one day I think maybe when I, I was thinking when you were talking to Isaac, one, one day maybe when when I'm on my last, you know, legs here, I might try to write something that really tells the full story of what we went through to get the to get contributors to the book. But, you know, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people didn't want to read the full book and we were demanding that you you know, we our book was going to be a critique of the work, not the man and not you know, our personal right. reflections on Ma right. Malcolm on the work itself. Right. And a number of people said, I don't want to read Marable's whole book, I don't want to take the time for that. Or other people said, you know, uh, I'm not getting paid, so I don't want to do it. Other people said uh, and I think the biggest one was, I you know more or less I don't want to be seen publicly as challenging somebody of Manny Marable's stature, particularly after he's passed. So you have this you know this sort of uh, 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 collection of, of of struggles here that have, have coalesced into not you know giving us. An, but I have you know not only the the, the work that we did and, and the contributors did and, and the editorial crew did you know the the, the publisher did. I am extremely confident and proud of what we've done here. And I have told many people, some with some name, anytime, anywhere, any forum, you tell us we will be there and we will get it on and have a, we will demonstrate the problems with this book. And we are constantly denied and dismissed as just haters or, which I proudly proclaim it myself as anyway, but, <laughs> but, 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 you know, it's haters or we just don't want, again, Malcolm to be humanized. And, and, and I reject that out, out, of, out of hand. So, um, again, similar to what I was saying about Gregory Reed, I think more people like the sister, in the, the elder sister in that video that you would see with Wendy Wolf should raise more questions. There are some serious concerns with the scholarship in this book, with the content of this book, we want to see some public discussion of it. Malcolm belonged to all of us, and so on and so forth. This is the argument that I've tried to with. You know, it, it's, it, it, we're not trying to dog Marable out for the sake of attacking him. In fact, we don't get very personal at all. It's, it's, it's focused specifically on his work. And I think that's what, and I think we've done a great job, quite honestly. We have time for making one more really quick question. Well, I mean, attacking him in the sense that, in the sense that, that I mean, we, we, I think we, we put in context his career a little bit, his, his relationship with Columbia University, the relationship Columbia University has with the, the city of New York, and particularly the struggle around the Audubon, preservation of the Audubon Ballroom. We put some of that into context, but what I mean by that is that we don't go at him in the way that, for instance, Marable went at Malcolm X, that we don't give unsupported statements, we don't say things that you would read in Marable's book, I, I don't want to say hundreds of times, the amount of times you read, maybe this happened or circumstantial evidence suggests that, or it may have been. I mean, he literally says in accusing Malcolm X of having an affair with an 18-year-old member of the OAAU that Malcolm may have been in the same hotel with her. That's the, the extent of the evidence. And this is what I'm saying. That's the point of attack. And, well, huh? That's the point of attack. Well, but, but again, so my point is we did not do that in the sense that we, we did not say anything that is not substantiated. I think the arguments, not, and we, not, the conclusions not, we reach. Not, 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 I'm sorry? You've got to really take that point. Take the choice to, to take these happy people. I'm sorry. We, 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 we point I, out I, the book. I, okay. I read the book. Yeah. I heard that called Malcolm uh, had homosexuality in general. We, we point out. See, right. Just, and, all right. I said, and all we said about that yeah. is that there's no evidence of that. And right. I think Greg, just, Greg Thomas has a great saying, essay right. on a book right. that talks about the political, uh, uh, what he calls, he says, Marable reduces sexuality to accusation. 
Um, so in the beginning of the book on page 66, there's, there's this passing reference to, to the autobiography and the, the claim that Malcolm was, was, was engaging in homosexual activity, which is really not even homosexual activity. Pouring talcum powder on a man who pledges himself is not what I would call homosexual activity. It's part of the hustle. But he doesn't, Malcolm doesn't say he did, he says somebody else did. And Marable says, we think he was talking about himself. But by the end of the book, when listing his attributes that make up the man Malcolm X, he's just listed as a homosexual. So, so this is the kind of nuanced fakery that goes in. Now again, my particular, I couldn't care less, to be quite honest, if he was or was not. My point is there's no evidence to suggest that he was, and it has no place in this book. That, and, we, and we point that out, and we point out yeah. the mistakes and the weaknesses of Marable's assertions by going at his sources. And we do do that. I mean, if you want to call that an attack, then that's what we do. 